Good, evening. thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I think let's get started. Yes. So Mubarak, would I be taking up the host and recording continues? All right. Yeah, Nimesh, you are the host and I have started the recording. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. So let me start with sharing my screen first. I yeah. hope you can see my screen, Vinny. Yeah, I can, I can see yeah. Nimesh. Fantastic. Now we get into first thing to get you the quick overview. I am sure that you have received the link uh, today yes. from yeah, Drive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that will be the drive which will be you know available to you throughout, and I'll be posting most of the content you know which is beyond your you know services which we'll be working on and okay. Yeah. Uh, if there is any you know, specific uh, content which you require, you know, as a part of our course dis discussion, which is not a part of this coverage, I will all be you know, sharing them in certain directories. So just to familiarize with you the directory structure right now, yeah. the first one goes to you. This will be the assignments where you know, all the assignments will be shared to you okay. and you have to try them and come back with some feedbacks. Yep. Uh, this will be the place where we will perform build and code. So we take some code and we try to build them. So it can be conceptual code, it could be sample code, it could be uh, learning some basic codes and so and so on. And also, you know, automation, building, build structures. So that all the, you know, lab work which will be performing, that will be a part of this build with code. Okay. Course coverage as it is, it remains here. The pre-reading materials which was uh, missing is placed over here. So you can okay. see, you know, one small snapshot of the PDF is available. You can go through whenever you have some time. Okay. So it's written by me as a small handbook. Yeah. Okay. And uh, then there will be a lot of references. So, you know, every time we come across some standards or some very good, you know, research papers or some fantastic, you know, uh, um, I mean, you know, the, the presentations which I would have attended in the pre previous, like Chicago, I had attended one oh, session, okay. which was a paid session. So, yeah, oh. so all, all the good ones, which I found that could be very useful to you, I have placed it over here. And oh. I hope that, you know, these, these could be of uh, some more referential uses in future. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So... Let's get started with this build with code. This will be the directory which I will be accessing most of the time to demonstrate to you how the code goes around. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, well, I would like to take a couple of minutes of pause before I start my virtual box and then, you know, restart with you. Hope that's fine with you. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I'm muting now for a minute. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.
So yeah, I'm back. Uh, hi, Anish. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Hi. So I hope you can see the screen here. Yeah, I can. I can see. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I am exactly at the directory which is uh, uh, C for Embedded Developer Training, and we have build with code. Okay. Okay. And here we have some, you know, build directory, example directories where we will be writing our program. So all the changes which I will be making over here, that will be visible to you after the session, you know. So okay. If I write a code over here, the code is available to you there and you can have an access or edit or create some various version and you can ask questions to me. Okay. Offline. All right. So let's get started for today's session. We our plan was to, you know, extend the build aspects of the program, okay, and how the program works, and you know what are the different aspects of the program in in, in the build cycle. You know? yeah. So the first thing is to know about when you write a program, what are the different kinds of link and build structures, you know, so. There are two kinds of a program. One is a statically linked program, and another one is called as a dynamically linked program. So whenever we write a C code, mm -hmm. okay, by default, you know, there is an exe created out of it, which we need, right? Yeah. So let's take a small example of a file called as demo.c file. And I'll do nothing but I'll have a main. As you know, the entry point must be a starting a main. Yeah. And maybe you put a return over here and notice that we do not have anything else it's an empty file yep. and now um, to build this program one of the ways dynamically build program so i can say something like gcc demo.c and my result is going to be demo.exe file okay okay so if you remember we know all the steps now that C to an I, I to an S, S to an O, and O to an EXE, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, so now I'm skipping that. It's not required that every build must undergo and you know dissect all the files. We can directly give a C file, and then we can expect an output file. Okay. And in this case, you will see the compiler will not generate any intermediate files. So I have a C file, I have an EXE file. Okay. Done? Now, how do I know about this file? So I say file demo.exe. And if you read, it is a binary file. It is, it's an executable. Okay. It describes the kind of machine it belongs to. And it also says dynamically linked. So first thing we have to understand is this is the default mechanism. If you remember, I spoke about that when you write applications, often you have some shared services attached with you, right? Right. Yep. So most of the EXE it uses the shared libraries. However, there is another build which is very popular in embedded. Now the problem with these dynamically linked programs are they're extremely slow. Why? As you know that you know a lot of symbols gets resolved after the program starts running. So at the time of execution is where linking happens. So it's like when you say dynamic linking, linking is postponed at the runtime, okay. right? Yep. And because of that, there is a lot of search penalty which my runtime library or environment has to perform. And maybe for a critical fast loading application, you know, yep. we need statically linked program and statically linked program what happens on those sides all the program gets resolved at compiled time and usually their starting addresses are also pre-planned and it is known to us okay like an example of bootloader bootloader is a statically linked program you can think of a kernel image is an example of statically linked program or some firmware image, which is an example of statically linked program. I write the entire stuff in C and I convert a binary file. 
So while the system is loading up or the program is loading up, there is no dynamic library available. Okay. Understand that? Yeah. So usually the binary files, which it does not have any dependency are statically linked. And to generate those files, GCC provides us an option called a static. And then what I do is I use the same file demo.c, but the output just I'm changing the name to be demo underscore static. You can use any name. I'm just for readability purpose okay. using this name. Now the moment I say ls, you can see we have got two exe. One was a demo.exe, yeah. and now we have the demo underscore static.exe. Now the moment I say file demo underscore static.exe, you can see it is the same exe file, yeah. but now it is statically. It means when we run this program, see execution wise, you will not see any difference. Though I'm not printing any stuff right now, okay, because I don't have a printf for any other statement. Yeah. Uh, demo.exe, yeah. Execution is not a problem. That's how you run the exe file, dot slash, and then demo.exe. It means in the current directory, dot refers to the current directory, slash, and then your exe name, you know? Yeah. So, so same thing here with the demo underscore static.exe. So from resultant, there is no difference, but the speed at which a demo.exe is going to run is going to be slow and faster in terms of demo static. The reason is there is no dependent library over here. Now, what does it mean? And how do I know the dependency of the library? So there is a command called as LDD, okay? It lists you the dependency of all the dynamic library. So the moment I say LDD demo.exe, you can see it's trying to explain you what? that this exe requires minimum three so files okay it means i need a get so file i need a libc so file and i need a dynamic linker file so what does this means this is a dynamic linker this is the c runtime library all your standard library like malloc calloc printf scanf you know, all those apis which you use they all are a part of this library and then the gate library is unique to certain architecture like Intel. You know, Intel comes with this 32-bit and 64-bit based architecture, right? Yeah. So sometimes they provide a faster way to perform a system call or something. So they, you know, so they have newer instruction. So in such cases, you will have a gate library available. But this may not be presenting all the architectures necessarily. Okay. What's required to know C? Let's see, you know, there is another command called as ls, right? Yeah. Now, ls is also an exe written by somebody. And usually it has its location. So I can say which ls. And that tells me that ls lies in a directory called as pin. Yes. Getting it? So this is the directory, bin, binary. And within that, there is an exe called as ls for me and i want to know about that exe so what i do i say file bin ls okay now you can see what's happening here it says that ls is an exe file for sure but it is dynamically linked oh, okay and now i want to know about the dependency of this file so what do I do? LDD yeah. slash bin slash LS. What does it say? More and more libraries depend. Yeah, more dependencies. Yeah. yeah. See, this is very important because, you know, by knowing what kind of shared libraries are required or DLLs are required to load an EXE on a target box, you know, tomorrow you will have challenges that you have to make an application run on a hardware, okay? Yeah. 
Now to run that application, there might be multiple SO files required by you. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Yep. And if you know what files are required, you can ship that as a part of my root file system. Okay. So a question is, do you know what is a root file system? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the minimum, the, the structure. The mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. At file tree structure, exactly, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So, you know, there you have different structure. It means some of the directory contains executable file, some of them contain some configuration file, some of them contain some read-only you know, structure, some of them contain some utilities which you are shipping, some of them are hidden files. Some of them are utility header files. Some of them are environmental files. Some may be some very utility scripts you have written. Some directory may contain only libraries required for that application, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's what. So for example, if I know these are the SO files, I can generate and leave directory and place all these SO. So it means if I have to run the LS file, I must have all these libraries present. If they aren't, the exe will not execute okay okay yes. we can show this when you learn about how to create a dynamic library okay, okay. shortly i'll explain this so is it clear right now i just wanted to check yes. that we learned about what a build styles in the program so how many types of styles are there so, i mean static and dynamic two types perfect but we should say statically linked application and dynamically linked application. Because the moment you say static build and dynamic build, it can be confused with libraries also. So statically linked apps style or dynamically linked app style. That's it. Okay. Yeah. So we have understood this part. Now the next thing is about investigating about how an exe works what part of the exe works. So knowing your executable file is also equally important, you know? Okay. So the question is, whenever I run uh, a demo.exe, you know, how does it know that it is an exe file and it runs? And how does it know that what kind of an exe file and it runs? Uh, it's an elf type. Elf. Yeah, so how do you know that is an elf type? So, you know, another question is to explain about you know, the, the way an EXE program is visible to us. You know, just to share you the, on the white. Now, let's try to see. exe layout the exe layout for a c program is mostly i would say having two views so one of the view is the programmer's view okay and another one is called as the systems view where the system understands that program you know so systems view is different than what a programmer's view is now how do i categorize this so let's assume that i have an demo.exe file okay now what does this exe file contains as a programmer perspective if you look at Programmer's perspective, it usually have two or three major section on it. You know, so program contains two or more sections. So I can think of usually there will be an a text segment and a data segment, you know. So if you look at an exe file. Okay, minimum requirement for it is like, you know, to create an exe with a code and a data segment attached with it. So I would say that, you know, we will have a, 
uh, a code segment minimum okay and another one let's take another color and then we will say we have a data segment so geographically i will like to you know project this okay the demo.exe internally can be viewed something like this and this becomes my text and this becomes my dot data of course it also contains one very important thing is the instruction pointer so logical address address is usually an instruction pointer plus the offset so cs or ds correct so EIP stands for extended instruction pointer in the ES, something like this. So, you know, this is your offset. So probably they also say CS colon EIP practically okay. and a DS colon EIP. So the you know, segment address and the pointer. So usually this is what? is an offset offset means the amount of you know memory you need to jump to the next instruction right that's your offset and now what you do is when you go for the next so now programmer so text segment also if you look at it has two kinds of text segments some of them which are absolute text it means they are resolved at compile time or the build time itself or the another one which is unresolved yet. So, you know, further uh, view, which you can think is uh, something like this. The text segment usually will have two more segments internally. So if you deeply examine any section, exactly. you know, this is a very core concept uh, we know. If you understand this, you know, you can start dissecting and investigate a very, you know, simple to a very complex executable file. Okay. okay. And it very really helps you when you want to debug an application back. Okay. And typically for hardware engineers, it might be a little tricky initially because of too many software concepts coming up. But you believe me that, you know, if you're working for a couple of years, you'll be, you know, more lethal in compared to a software developer. Okay. Because, you know, you will come from both the background, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's like you can see what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. So now we'll talk about, again, coming back here. Uh, a text segment has an absolute text. It means an entry address, which I already know, which is just called as the text dot text. And the another one is called as the relocatable text. So we call it as dot rel dot txt. Relocatable text in the sense the code segment or the program is residing somewhere else. Okay. Okay. It means you can think of this shared library as a very good example. Okay. Like when you make a call to a printf, the definition of the printf is not a part of your exe. Right. Yeah. It is in the shared library. Okay. But the moment you want to I execute your program. It tries to relocate as a part of. So as a part of dynamic linker, what it does, it searches that SO file to you and it connects that file in the file system where it is mapped. And that map area has been assigned to you. So it's like, you know, getting a value of X at position Y. Okay. Yeah. That offsetting is done over here. Okay, so text segment further has these one resolved symbols and one is unresolved. Okay. So relocatable is an example of unresolved symbols. Now from the uh, data section, if you look at in C for programmers view, there are four sections which gets created. Okay. In fact, in broad version, you can think two data sections, but by Allocation is statically and or compile time and maybe dynamically. So dynamically resolved data and compile time resolved data are two major sections 
and they further split uh, two by themselves. So total becomes four sections. Okay. So you know we will just try to you know add that as a part. And you know I just wanted to build some quick ones here. So the next first section here will be called as a dot data section. The second one is called as dot BSS section. The third section is called as the heap section. And the fourth section, what we call it is a stack. You know? So these are the four major sections of a programmer's view. Now, what do you mean by these data and others? So I wanted to say that you know, this is an example of statically linked program. So it's statically. Or compile time. Okay. okay. Maybe I should format it to lower here. Yeah. And this part is something which is a happening at runtime, you know. This part. It means the allocation for these sections happens at exactly runtime. So you can say uh -huh. runtime. Now another very important thing is. So how do you know what is heap and what is stack? They are the ones which is, you know, used for runtime memory location. And it's, it's for, you know, attaining a faster speed at which your application runs. You know, when you're not sure of how much and, uh, heap memory and you know, stack operations are helpful, okay? When it's defined or uh, yeah, when it is not aware, you know, see if you do not know how much memory you are going to need at runtime, okay? okay, then what you do is you you usually actually you know leave this to a runtime library to decide how you will be using the RAM area. Okay, like you know when you use a malloc, it's a very clear cut understanding that okay, I'll be asking a runtime memory handler or a library to allocate certain memory from RAM. Okay. okay, and when I'm not using it, I will be freeing them. Okay. So ideas like that. However, in an embedded application, it is a bad design. They say that, you know, we don't like heap or malloc. We should pre-allocate all the memory needed for an application in advance. That's okay. all. Okay. That is the best strategy. Yeah. So any critical application don't need to go for too much heap management. But yeah. then, you know, if you have degree of multi-programming, now, what I mean by this is that, see, today you have an application, two applications shipped for a customer. Okay. And you have, a, say, 64 meg of RAM for that. And uh, the assume that, you know, you have to maintain this hardware for the next uh, six years from the customer. You know, you don't expect customer to change this hardware for the next six years. Okay. But however, you need to keep updating your system, right? Yeah. So maybe next year you want to keep him still attractive and irrelevant by saying, hey, there is one more utility we have developed and this is a new application we want to plug in there. Mm -hmm. And next year you want to add one more application. So earlier you had, when you shipped, it had two applications. And after two years, it might have five applications running over them on the same box, you know? Okay. It, don't you think that when you increase the number of apps, the consumption of RAM will also increase, right? Yes. So imagine that if you had pre-allocated a lot of memory and fixed it, then accommodating the newer application can be a big challenge. Right, yeah. So that is why a statically linked application may not be always a good choice. Maybe having a dynamically linked program will give me a lot of shared code. And because of lot of codes can be shared, my RAM is still free and degree of multi-program can be increased. So that's the reason of why people want to still process with the heap management. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, of course, you should know that, you know, these all things are some logical partitions for programmers to make their life easy, to make more better decisions in their applications while they are writing algorithms, right? And, and also to give you an edge because there will be a limit for every, you know, application. For example, if I have a 4G of RAM, at no point of time an application can demand 6G of RAM. It will never work, right? Right. Yeah. Limitation. Yeah. So there will be a hard limit and there will be a soft limit from the configuration perspective. So every operating system, what they do is when they are up, no, they provide some kind of system resource. Now, when I say system resources, means your stack size can be of only one meg by default. You can configure them mm -hmm. manually through some APIs or through some utilities or tools, you can change a hey, not for this application. I need, you know, eight meg of stack or 16 meg of stack because I have too many locals to work in some places you can change them. So resources of a particular process can be tuned up and down, you know? Okay. But is yeah. there a standard um, way of approaching like how much stack is required? Of, I mean, uh, you know, like that, I just, uh, no, there are some standards. For example, you know, uh, if you look at Linux or Unix boxes, they provide something like sys resource called a set R limit and you know get R limit kind of stuff. You know, and in those cases, you can you know increase the size of uh, system resources. However, every process by default is given some kind of minimum resources. Okay. Though it is off uh, this query, I can quickly. Show share you that example here. You know, in Linux, we have a command called as ulimit. User's limit, it's a typo. You can see my screen, right? Yeah, I can see. So if you look at ulimit, it gives you, you know, for every process, there is a limitation. A core file, how much size can it be? What kind of priority it is running with? Size files pending signals for that application. If there is any locked memory by you for a process, maximum memory size it can attend. What is the stack size we can see here? Okay. Here, can you see that? Yes, I can. So it says 8192K bytes. Okay. It means it's like eight meg kilobytes, right? 8192 kilobytes is eight meg. And if I want to change them, I can do so by saying, say, this S refers to that I'm looking to change the stack size. And then I can say something like, you know, 1024. Okay. And as you can see, yeah. yeah. And the, the impact can be also very, you know, damaging because of this. So if you say you limit minus A to be, say, some 10K, and now if you say ls or you know minus s not okay this is damaging can you see what's happening yeah you get a segmentation for it it has to hit right because you you really reduce the stack uh, beyond that the application couldn't run you know right right it's just dying okay. yeah. so you know it is possible to configure through api and all but there is some default that's okay. what i mean yeah. So coming back to the whiteboard. So I was trying to say that, you know, when you compile and run this application, these are the meanings. Now as a C programmer, what means what? So data means initialized segment, initialized data. Okay. VSS means uninitialized data. The heap means you know, runtime map request or BRK request. Some APIs by which you allocate memory, you know, like okay. a wrapper like malloc, calloc, realloc, and free. These kind of APIs are used to control these kind of, you know, heap management at a high level for programmers. If you're a system programmer, you refer MMAP, MAP, BRK, SBRK kind of an API, okay? 
And stack is meant for local variables or local data. So just to you know look at this example, okay. if I say if I have an int main, and if I say I have static int data. If I say int global data assigns to zero cross one. If I say int okay common. If I say static int table lookup table lot of say. If I'm running a program like this, and then if I say int local, if I say int star or char star some buffer assigns to malloc of some 128 bytes. This is all a pretty you know, a good example of trying to address which part of the code goes where. Okay. So can you, you know, we can understand. Yeah. So all the global variables and static variables which are initialized, okay, okay, they will go and sit in the data segment. So what we can say that this variable which is here it is initialized right yeah yeah so that should go and sit in the data segment because it is an initialized it the same goes even to this variable this will also go and sit in why because it is a not a local variable is a static variable and it is initialized to some value so it won't sit there uh, if you look at the another data let's say this one this is an example of what uninitialized data I'll go and sit in bss a static variable with this hundred this also is uninitialized it will go and sit in bss bss is an example of block started by symbol okay oh. so ibm yeah ibm with the intel i360 you know architecture they came out with that idea that you know it might be possible that all the variables may not be initialized to some known value right we want to postpone those values for some external event maybe some external event comes through a sensor and slaps a value so you know i don't want to give an initial value to it Though later we realize that leaving a data uninitialized is a bad choice. That leads to a lot of, you know, uh, bugs. Okay. But it is a historical available. Yeah. Now, if you look at this buffer, you know, buffer is a pointer which holds an address, a block chunk of 120 bytes of memory. Okay, so that refers to the malloc. So we can think of here this one this one goes and sits over here and if you look at this local variable it is very obvious that it will be sitting in the stack yeah and this is controlled you know like there is a different this is also part of the you know very specific concept which we get into. So a lot of people talk about this programmers view memory in terms of storage classes. Also. So I'm sure that you know you must be aware of this. Yeah. yeah. So you know in, in classical C there is a concept of storage class. which talks about, you know, a school. And lifetime of a variable or a data. Or code. 
and keywords like extern, keywords like static, keywords like auto, and keywords like register were pretty popular. So from classical C and CC programming, this is something you will see that, you know, there are four storage classes in C, which is very popular, which gives you the way you can control the scope and lifetime of a particular data or a code segment. Okay. So how do we, you know, uh, understand them a little bit more in detail is by this example, which you can see here. So if you have a static variable, which is a global static variable, in this case, this one, what do you think is the meaning of it? Can you highlight the meaning of it? Are you aware about the meaning of it? Um, what does it mean in a C program? So the table, um, it's, it's in, it's it's not an array, right? I mean, it's uh, it's an array. Of course, it is an array. An array. Um, so, which can hold um, like that's hundred. fine. Some some hundred into maybe whatever the size of the word integer is. Yeah. Yeah. But lifetime and scope is important. So, the moment you say static, you say that it is a global variable. Okay, it's a global static variable, which can be accessed only within the file. So one is the accessibility. It is private to this file only. What does it mean? It is private to this file. So if I say sample.c file, and if I say app.c file, yeah, just to give you an, another view. So we cannot make use of this variable in the another source code directly. Okay. That's the meaning. So, so it is like a private data within this file. Okay. Got it. But within that file, it can be modified, right? I mean, we can exactly. It can be. It is global. Any functions can edit it okay. in that file. But nobody can access it outside the file. So if I say something like table underscore LUT of hundred is equal to something like this. Okay. Yeah. It is not possible. Okay. Yeah. But it is perfectly fine to say and use a common. There's a common variable. Okay. Okay. So you can use a common also. You can use the global details. Both. So these both are correct. Okay. Why? Because they are not a static variable, but still global variable. Okay. So by default, C will make them external. You don't need to put a keyword called as external. The moment you declare a global variable outside of particular function in C, it is referred as what? External. It is assumed as external. It means some other files can also make use of it. That is the whole idea. You know, in C, this is the thing here. Everything works on a global variable. You know, you pass the message, you pass everything. You know, it's like, you know, monkey climbing a tree. All the trees and branches gets finally connected to one of the big stem, which is connected to a root. And that root is your mean. Okay. So mean calls a function, another function, to another function, to another function, to another function. No matter you write a one billion lines of source code, or a hundred lines of source code, whether you write a single function code or you write multiple function code, you write across source code. The whole idea for you to communicate and modularize is to main, increase the maintainability and readability in the code, number one. Mm -hmm. And also 
to ensure that you know the changes which are there can be easily maintained and visible by other you know uh, colleagues of yours if it is a large school correct okay. yeah so communication will always happen you will see through these global data memory or methods same thing goes with this variable how about the commenting of this uh, static int data here which is inside the mean mean now the scope of this variable is within this mean only it means from the accessibility perspective not the lifetime okay it means nobody can use this data outside this file or oh, sorry outside this function or outside this file both so it means if i have a function here foo and it wants to make use of say data it won't work why because it is you know publicly visible only within that function within yeah yeah within main it is okay but not in any other function remember that but then why are we using this the idea is that we want to privatize it also and we want to retain the value of a function so now let's look at so this was what we spoke about the way accessibility is there their scope whether it is file scope whether it is functional scope or whether it is across the file correct right yeah yeah now we are going to get into lifetime of it what do you mean by lifetime all the static variables and global variables are initialized only once it means they are only allocated once okay hence they can retain the value across the function call hence they can do what retain the value across the function call and this is not true with the local variables the reason is local variables are stored in stack the idea of stack is the moment the function gets over the data is out of the scope it means the stack operation you know it is a push and it's a pop correct okay. Yeah. so the moment you start a function you push a data it's like you are creating a frame stack frame and the moment you return from a function what i do i pop all those data frame so i'm back from one frame to the another frame right yes that's the whole idea so local variables cannot retain their value across the function call but the static variables can just to give you this quick example can you see the box yes all right so i will add this uh, demo.c file which we had okay no i had to delete the the we change the stack size right yeah so that got deleted so i'm going to just get into the drive and we had c4 embedded and i have this mill with tools here and then i am on build so we had this file demo.c if you remember right So of course now we are going to add one of the very popular header file to the io which contains basic io mechanism yeah. and you know there is a print f hello world kind of stuff right yeah. which i am not going to use we will just use function say okay calculate v1 it's a version 1 okay. and we will have a static int data assigns to 0 and we'll say plus plus data okay and 
we will have the similar function written by us, which will be a second version of the function. You know, so functions are something in syntactically, you can think that the function will have a name of the function. This is the open and close bracket where you can pass or place parameters in the function. Okay. And this body talks about the return type of the function. So when I say void, it says that there is no return right now. Then the braces here talks about the starting body of the function. It's also called as prologue. And then the ending of the function, which is called as epilogue. It means here we build the stack at line number four, you can think. And at line number seven, we return. So it happens to be what? Unwinding of the stack. So creation of the stack and unwinding of the stack takes place over here. Okay. Yeah. Now you can see uh, we have two things here. And we can have one one printf statement on these. So printf. And data in calculator v1 is now now when we print this is mod mod d means decimal and i can print an integer variable like this so there are basic form file formats like percentile d i s for string c for character f for it float lf for long l i for long integer or ld which I'm sure you are aware to a certain extent. Yes, yes. Yeah. And this I am going to make it as a V2. And I'll change the name of the function also here as V2. Right? All right. And now what we do is we call these functions for a couple of times. So what I do is this V1 is being called for three times. Okay. And I just print F starting. and then I'll place a stack data. Okay. Let me place this, you know, calculate V2 now. And we'll try to observe, you know, how does it okay. behaves. Open up another terminal. And I'll say GCC demo dot C minus O demo dot no, AX. Am I there? Okay, I'm in there. Okay. Just a sec. Okay. I'm on them built. And then I say GCC my demo dot C minus O girls demo dot C sorry exe. And now I run this program demo dot exe. So what observation do we make?
So the the function calculate and score V one and V two. Yeah, yeah. So can you see the value which is changing in the first one? Yeah. And the second one does not. Correct. So this is a very clear evidence that you know whenever you create a static variable, the allocation happens only once in the lifetime. And it retains the value across the call. So if you initialize to zero, every time you increment it, uh, because it is not reallocating again and again, at the same place, you are seeing the increment. Okay. But, but when you use a local variable, which is a non-static variable, it is suffering from that push and pop logic. So every time the function gets over, the memory is free. Every time the function is called, memory is allocated. So allocation, deallocation, allocation, deallocation. Oh, okay, okay, understood. So because of that, it cannot retain the value across the call. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. So this is very interesting, you know, say for example, if you have some static variable, it is very nice for, suppose I have some external temperature sensor or humidity sensor, or maybe some external, you know, data pro which is coming from a line. Okay. And you expect that, you know, it will be a continuous function data you want to create from it. Or you want to maintain account for fluctuation or, you know, something of that. So yeah, yeah. I think it is a perfect, uh, you know, declaration for you. Correct? Okay. Okay. And it retains within this function also. So somebody cannot access this data outside anyway, right? For example, I cannot say data here. Compiler will complain me saying that I don't know where are you coming from, right? Yeah, it's not defined. Uh, it's not defined and all those things, as you guessed it. It doesn't say that there's any declaration there. Declaration. It's just... Yeah. Because the visibility is still there. All the variables which are declared within the function, that hides it from the external other function. I think that's a fair enough step. Okay. Yeah. All right. So coming back to this uh, demonstration to back to this. Now we were talking about the heap section as well, right? I think, yes. yeah, sorry, whiteboard, yeah. We were also talking about the, you know, other stuff also like, you know, stack working, but you know, we didn't test the heap aspects of it. So, you know, if you look at heap, BSS, and data, uh, there is one more unique concept which we come across called as program break. Not many people know about this. Okay. It's called as what? Program break. Program break is a very nice concept. It explains about how do you guess where your heap memory starts from. Okay, so program break. Hey, I thought it was a board. Yeah. yeah. So program break. Program break means the address past the BSS. That is the meaning of program break. Getting it. Address past the BSS. So, you know, one can easily guess where my runtime memory is starting from because of this program break. And you can find an approximate place to allocate the new memory, you know. Okay. So, so that's the whole idea of a program break. So it's another concept which you should be aware. It is used for approximation that, okay, where is my statically allocated, pre-allocated memory? And from where is that the dynamic memory starts from? So nice watermark for me. Okay. In fact, you know, certain uh, compilers and runtime libraries like GNU, glibc, glibc, bionic libc, these all are some C runtime libraries. 
which actually allows you to see them. So if I have to show you that, there are some exported variable called as say man e n d n. Now you can see what it is. E text, e data, and end. Now, man is a command used for manual. I'm sure you are aware about right, it. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. The end talks about, let's see what does it, the end says. Okay. The BS is removed. So it is address past the? The BSS. BSS. Yes. That's what it tries to explain. Okay. It also gives you a small example which you can try. So what it is, we can get the addresses also. It means I can take this program and I can easily run it over for you. Say. And then I say GCC minus O dot exe. Not necessarily to use a dot exe or something, just for yeah. understanding purpose. So as you can see, these are some addresses which is being printed. It means these are the locations where your text segment gets over and data segment start. This is the place where data segment gets over and BSS starts. And this is the place where you BSS gets over and the actual break starts. That means from there is where the new memory will be allocated for run. Okay, that is what it is. Okay. Yeah. You have any questions on that? Fine. Um, no, I think I'm I'm good. Um, cool. All right. Now you know there was one more thing from the static variables to the file declaration we spoke which was about scope and accessibility. So let's test that as well. So let's say we app.c file. And it has some function say calculate. And notice that he's trying to say that, hey, I have an, I know that there is a variable called as external int uh, global and data which I want to print over here. So the external blue data from demo.c is mod D and I'm expecting that the global data to be printed. Okay. So what I'm trying to say here is that hey i have a function which will use the global data but global data will not be defined by me no? external means it's a true declaration memory does not get allocated okay so somebody else is the owner of this file okay okay, okay that is the meaning so i'll show you this by using a split and then i'll use that let's try to see this way Just trying to buy some space so that both the files can be seen together. Okay. All right. Yeah, roughly you can see, I guess. Uh, files. Maybe, maybe. So to some extent, you can see there's a file on the left hand side. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's much better. So, you know, I will declare a global variable here, which is int global data, and I'll assign to be say FF, FF. Okay. Something like, you know, 655, 65355, right? Something like that. 65,535, here. And I'm printing that over here. So, and how do you know this function? I will call this function somewhere here, say, at the end. Calculate 
is my function. Now the problem is this calculate function is not there in this file. Yeah. So I will make that as an extern here, saying that hey, there's a function somebody else has written. What is what? Calculate. Even though you do not do this, you know that if there is an undefined variable, it will automatically or function, it will automatically be assumed as what? External. External function. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna just try to edit this here. So I would say now GCC, I need to use both the files. So I'll say demo.c file. And then I have to use app.c file. And then output is going to be, say demo.exe file. There's one incompatible warning, which we can ignore right now. You see here you have used a printf function. Yeah. But you haven't used the header for that. Oh, okay, include. Okay. Pretty, yeah, uh, it's pretty. So it's assuming that it is the same STDI you are using. Okay. Now you can see the program has well compiled. Yeah. And you can see the value has come out in decimal yeah. 6558. Correct? Yeah. So you understood the accessibility of the global variable, right? Yeah. Now just for the same program, what am I going to give? I'm going to give, make the same variable to be static. I'm gonna use one of them without static. And then I will say, if define, share it. Share across file else don't share it across the file. So now you know what will happen. Is this particular symbol defined by me before this program? Before this file? Yeah. My question. So oh. I have this symbol, share across file. Do we have this anywhere written? We don't have that, yeah. We don't have. So by preprocessor, which part should be included? Only the second part. And because it is static, what should be the limitation? It cannot be accessed in this? Uh, in the external file. Not exactly. The, yeah. So what I do is when I compile the same program, what does it say? So the global data is not defined. Oh. Makes sense. Yeah. Right. You could also see what is the switch I can use to know the actual code expansion. You remember? Mm -hmm. GCC caps E. Yes. I can say demo.c and I can redirect the file to what? Demo.i. I can always open a and demo.i file over here in another tab maybe, vim demo.i file, and I, what happened to, okay, the problem with this is every time you open a window, it becomes a non-shared, uh, remote shared, so I'm not connected to a drive, so I have to be uh, a drive connector, so. So the, I, you have mapped uh, Google Drive? Or? Yeah, I've mapped the Google Drive uh, with my virtual box so that any changes which I do here, it is live available to you. Okay. So I wanted to also confirm that, can you get into the directory and see if it is available yeah. in parallel? Okay, do that. By the time, I will just check this here. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Get into the media direct, uh, that, you know, the Google Drive, drive and uh, build directory. And then, yeah, I have a Google Drive. Now I have a build. Cool. And then I have a build directory. 
Yeah, I can see here. I don't know whether you can see there. As you can see here, I have expanded this program. Okay. I mean, under the build directory. Yeah, under the build directory. Can you share your screen? Maybe I can see there and guide you. Sure. All right. You can you can see my screen. Okay. Yeah, I can see this build with code. I can see the tool chain nodes. Uh, can we go back a little bit? Yeah, I think it is not synced yet. Oh, it is still syncing here. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it might take some time. Uh, it might take some time. It okay. says me it is updating here, syncing something. Okay. Um, give me a minute, okay? Maybe sure. by the end of session, it should be there. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. yeah. Thanks. So it should appear there. Yeah. Okay. I, I stopped sharing. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I'll be here. So I was trying to show you this, you know, meanwhile, the .i file, if you remember, I'm here. So this file was created to me. And you will say demo.i file. And then you will see that, you know, it is already available to you. Refer to line number 849. Yeah. Right. So because of this, it is not allowing me to access this value. Now you see, because of this, if defined, can we include this? Now I think you know this, how to include it. Um, uh, we spoke about this last time, that we have a switch. GCC can be compiled with an option called as dash capital D. Oh, right, right, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, and there I can see this, you know, symbol I can copy and paste. Across. Yeah. yeah, so maybe just avoid the typo, I'll just double click here. Yeah. Copy, come back, paste it in. And now you can see the program compiled, it didn't give me any give compilation any. error. So, you know, we can control this through our build, right? If I can write a make file on this, it can be easily controlled by passing this switch that if you want to share your build, otherwise the program will not be built. Right? Yeah. Control yeah. is the yes. Yeah. All right. So I think that brings to an understanding about what the users or programmers view of, you know, the exe file. Just to quickly conclude uh -huh. that an exe comprises of text segment and a data segment. And for the text has two major segments called as relocatable text and the known or resolved text. Data section is having two core sections. One is a compile time allocated section and one is a runtime allocation. The compile time section has a initialized data segment and an initialized data segment called as data and BSS. And then we have runtime uh, section, which is called a stack and heap. Now there is no, if you see that there is one more thing. There is no logical way of partitioning where is heap and where is stuff. Okay. They are a part of the same memory, runtime memory. Okay. Only the thing in majority of the architecture is the way a stack grows and the way a heap grows is exactly in the opposite direction. It's like magnet. Okay. Inversely proportional. Exactly inversely. So stack grows downwards and a heap grows upwards. So there's a less chance of crash, but if a program starts hogging a lot of stack, means local variable, and a lot of heap memory, eventually they will go and fire it, each other. Okay. So this watermarking usually, you know, which you have to do, you need, you know, some kind of uh, techniques to, you know, so various ways, you know, okay. techniques. to handle the firefighting.
techniques to fire the fighting is you know like you know there are some techniques by which some apis are available where you can put some barriers or you can put some unique signature by which the moment you go and hit that signature you identify that hey stack has been smashed mm -hmm. by heap and then you know we need to find some way to signal the application and then find a way to you know reallocate some extra stack memory from the heap if stack has gone out or if heap is in, in encroached certain stack area then we need to come out and see if we can free some other memory and try to start from somewhere else yeah just a question. Actually, if you go, memory, yeah, go ahead. The memory leakage concept oh. that the issues. I mean, it's going to be part of this heap and stack, or it's. Of course, of course, there only. All the memory leak and memory corruption or data corruption happens because of the heap and stack issues. Okay. This BSS and data are compile time allocated. If at all there is an error at the build time, it will say it is too large. Okay. okay. You know. Either because of constant is too large or memory is beyond what you are accepting is too large. It will be having a limit. Okay. Okay. So usually, you know, in, in program, uh, that's a good question. You know, um, what you do is, uh, when you, <coughs> so we wanted to know about, okay, how do I know? you know, what part of the data is being crashed and what is not being hit, right? Yeah. So if, if uh, I take the previous program itself here, and if I wanted to add, um, say, it's an array of uh, some four dimensional array. I'm trying to build this. You can see it's compile time error itself. Okay, it's too large. So only the places is you cannot guess the same thing if it is meant for runtime. So if I say something like a character some buff for See, this constant value is so large that it can be pre-calculated. Okay. 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 So it is already explaining that there is an expression which is going beyond overflow. So modern compilers, what they are trying to do is they want to avoid this expensive operation of multiplication at runtime. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, so this multiplies, this multiplies. This. So what compiler is saying that anyway, there will be a final value of this. And they by default perform a optimization to perform this job. And because of that, it is being caught because the, you know, because multiplication is being performed at compile time only. And it knows the number there large. This could be very interesting if you place this inside a while one. Okay. And reduce this scalar value. So I am in freeing the memory, but I'm constantly allocating it. Allocating it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is the simplest way to enjoy your code. Yeah. Uh, and now there is no way, you know, compiler can catch this up. Okay. It just say an implicit direction declaration is warning because we haven't used stdio.h to a stdlib.h expects. So standard library contains the definition okay. for all the standard utilities, including malloc's control. 
So that will reduce the error first, uh, sorry, the warning first. As we know, this is 11, line number 11 needs to be commented. It's yes. very large. And then we'll have this code here. Oh, this is really bizarre because, you know, the program, okay, what, what did I do? Demo on EX. Yeah. Now this program is like, you know, definitely going to continuously perform a leak. And at some point of time, it's the system will have out of memory. Okay. I have to kill this code reader. Yeah. So that's a, this is a, a kind of a leak. So, you know, deduction of this needs some unique special APIs to handle this thing. Okay. There are some techniques like, you know, there are concept called as stack guards. Oh, okay. Stack guards. Like the way we uh, stack guards, GU, yeah, stack guards. And there are some APIs by which you can protect these stacks you know, being smashed or you can detect that stack has been smashed by. Okay. These are strong APIs available on Linux by which you can know that, oh, this is somewhere, you know, where you have been caught. Stack guard APIs are available for placing a unique page, which is a deniable page. So what we do is we use a technique of, you know, you know the paging concept in hardware, right? And software. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what we do is we, you know, allocate a page. Okay. And we make them, you know, non read and write. So it is like deny read, deny write and deny access. So we, change that page to be completely denied from being accessed. Now the moment it's like I have reserved a page after a stack size. So of course I'll be wasting one of the page, but the intent here is different in this program. What we want is to stop the stack smash or deduct the stack smash at least. What went wrong, right? So by placing this particular page as a guard, it's like, you know, when you play cricket, you have a guard, right? So yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a very important to protect yourself. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so if it's a critical application and we need a stack and we need to find them out, guard helps doing this job. Okay. So the moment you hit the deny right, it gives you a stack error and you protect that. You know, so APIs are available. Maybe you know, if you get a chance or if you feel like you 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 can also spend some time in learning Linux in future embedded Linux. Yeah. Uh, you know, it can be, you know, it, it will be more useful for you only, only when you decide, I mean, not now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Say there are something like P thread and it's called GTR. A lot of APIs, but uh, yeah, I'll show you one. I think it is denying me. Yeah, I got that. Let's see. Can you see this uh, API here? Uh, yeah, set, set guard size. Yeah, yeah. 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 So set the guards. So when you run a process or a thread, very clearly it says. So it allocates an additional region with the least guard size bar. If it is zero, of course there's no guide area. At least whatever the system offers, one page is accepted there. Okay. I mean, if it is success, it's fine. If it is error, non-zero value will be specified. Okay. So you can see here, what it says, it takes a virtual memory page and that are protected to prevent read and write. Access. Okay. Yeah. So the moment it overflows, no, it will give you a signal. And then there are techniques by which we can attack and, you know, a reserve programmatically only at the runtime. We can additionally allocate some memory and handle that application also so that application doesn't get you know embarrassed okay. okay yeah it's a lot of you know techniques yeah. available in software yeah 
All right. So I think that roughly gives you uh, uh, information about related to the programmer's view of the meaning. Okay. Maybe we should take a couple of minutes break, maybe two, three minutes of break. Is it fine with you? Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. yeah. And then we will be yeah, back. Yeah. With, no. yeah. Then we will again resume for the next uh, some time about knowing the systems view. Okay. I'll, uh, so you can be mute and take a break and five. Yeah, five minutes. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. So I think let's get into now the systems view. The systems view is something which you know users do not always anticipate because they're just you know you can think as an application program. That you know whatever we spoke about right now. Okay, okay, these are things. This is how it's working around, and so and so. On. Code flow, fine, perfectly. Okay. The challenges comes when we have to understand and intercept some of the things what OS could be doing on behalf of us. You know, so there is a systems view also getting added, and how these application gets you know investigated to a more deeper level than what we have seen right now. Okay, that is where personality or binary comes in. So systems view is majorly, you know, whenever you want to talk, it, it will be of uh, like, you know, the, the reading about the binary personality view. That is very important. And when I say this binary personality, it's all about how an exe can be understood by also, right? By a machine. And, and why do we not need to know this is we can understand the file format intercompatibilities also. Sometimes the distribution and investigation needs to know that which machine you are coming from, what's your starting point, can I change those addresses, is the relocation properly or not, is there any you know, dependency of library required by your exe or not. You know? so a lot of tools are used in, in, in this uh, process. And if you look at the GNU tool, no? the GNU tool chain set, you'll find that there are four or five major components which I have documented for you as a part of tool chain mix. Okay. okay. So remember we were talking about the tool chain, right? Yes. So you know five major components in a GNU tool chain. One first naturally it should be a GCC, which is a compiler. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is going to be the glibc, mm -hmm. which is a you know GNU library for C. The third component is the OBJ or probably bin utils, bin. binary utilities. Yeah, bin utils. And the fourth one is your GDB, which is optional, but mostly shipped right now. And then there are something called as kernel headers. So these are some, you know, mandatory part of our tool chain distribution. So any vendor is giving you an SDK, right? Mm -hmm. Tool chain is a major part of that SDK distribution. They might have some utility, flashing utility, this utility, that example applications and so, but tool chain is the main thing, right? They ship along with, like Linario is having, Linario is having a good tool chain. Uh, then you have something like have you have you worked on some of the tool chains? Do you guys get a chance um, to work on? Yeah, I mean, for it's part of the the build. Uh, uh, I mean, you guys do as part. Do you build two chains? Uh, yeah, I mean, we uh, we, we we I have worked on the, the like the application software. Um, uh, mm -hmm. We call it MTC, Manufacturing Test Code. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. we, we use like, this is kind of a prerequisite to build. Naturally. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Then it's fine. I think then there is, I don't need to spend some time here. Yeah. So, you know, in this GNU tool, what we can do is, you know, uh, uh, we can think of the bin utils providing me some utility, right? Yeah. So there are, you know, uh, the readers of an EXE, the question is how does an EXE gets understood by the machine, you know, yeah. and that is where this file format and system program come in picture. So a loader comes in picture. Okay. 
So th this is uh, useful with an example. Okay. So assume that just getting an off uh, code, like all the EXEs which you have, we have you know some file format uh, binaries, right? So can we list some of them if you are aware? Like the ones you said, something like you know an elf for you, right? Yeah. So so we can list some more, maybe. Oh. You aware? Like like say the ELF is one. You must be aware about cough, C O F F. You must be aware about P E. You must be aware about I hex. It must be a SREC, Motorola less record format. I hex, Intel hex record format, portable executable file format, common object file format. Okay. Execu executive and you know executable executable and linking file format, ELF, ELF, and then you have something like you know, you know OABI, Open Application Binary Interface from ARM, EABI, Embedder ARM Binary Interfaces for ARM. I didn't, I didn't um, hear these. these oh, two. okay. OABI and EABI. Yeah, yeah IBCS, V2. Uh, no, these are some different kinds of binary profiling which we do for when you're building a CPU, right? Okay. It's very closely related to ODM and OEM, I mean. See, if you're coming out with a silicon hardware tomorrow, a new chipset, say. So that chipset has to support some compiler, right? Correct. Yeah. And then compiler must create a particular file format, right? Okay. Yeah. Which has to be understood by the loader or the OS which will be running. So it could be any of these format, you know? Okay. Like, for example, for ARM, they prefer to have the ELF to be of EABI type, you know? Okay. okay. Yeah, embedded ARM binary interface kind of thing. Yeah. But what's all of them is that these all are binary file, nothing else. Different type of file, but all of them are a binary file. The question is how does the machine understand that it is only a binary file, but nothing else? Let's try to cheat it and understand this. Yeah. It will further help you. So assume that I have to run this program, say, app.c and my you know shell says hey i don't understand this it's not an exe file correct because it's a c file how does a demo.exe runs and it understands that it's an exe file yes okay right so can it be only the permission so if i look at say ls dash l app.c file and if i say a demo.exe file how come the tool chain is so smart that whenever it creates an exe, it gives an executable permission to them? Yeah. But here we have given the exe permission, but still it is not allowing it to execute, isn't it? Correct. Yes. So there must be some verification inside. And that's what the job of loader is. So oh. systems, yeah. So systems view let you, you know, understand this code. And this dynamic loader or the loader program is very similar to any, you know, uh, system program. Now, Assume that I will give you one more problem. Let's get away from this. You try solve this. Okay. I will give you a hard drive which is filled with text file. Okay. Okay, all the text files are there. And I will tell you to read the content from those text files. Mm -hmm. But you will not be given any text editor. Okay, it's like passing the date. You, you're getting me, yeah. For example, another example, just analogy wise, I'll give you a hard drive which is filled with your favorite MP3 files. All the best song which you like is filled in there in this years. Okay. And now I will say, play those songs, but you will not be given any MP3 player. Do that. Yeah, it's not possible. Yeah. You're getting it? Yeah, yeah. So I am expecting you to think, what does it take to be an MP3 file? What does it take to be an GIF file? What does it take to be an MPEG file? MPEG layer one, layer two, layer three file. What does it take to be an OGG file? Why did it take to an IMX controlled file or MMXX file? 
or an MP4 file or WMP4 file or you name, you know, yeah. any other file. So, you, and, and then only you can decide, right? So if you look at any file in this world, you know, these 60,000 or different files which we have, they're uniquely identified by some extension, right? Yes. Yeah. But extension is one thing. Extension cannot, I cannot change a, a MP3 file and rename it to a text file and say, hey, notepad, play the song for me, right? Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't work. So it is very clear that the file format has some style under which we need to understand them. Yeah. You know? So all these files, including the exe file also, whether it's an ELF type or PE type, they all have two major sections in them. Okay. One is called as the header. And the another is the body, which is we call it as section. So the header section and the body section. Okay. So whenever a program wants to read an MP3 file, the first thing is to understand the MP3 file format design. It means understand the, its first header file. Know okay. the name of the file, the album name of the file it comes where, whether the values of the MP3 codec for version is what there. Is it a video file it is using a frame buffer or it is using an audio or it's using something else, you know? Okay. So based on that, okay, what is, whether it is a little Indian or a big Indian, so by looking at the header structure, I will come to know what kind of codec I have to use, what kind of scheduling I have to use, what is the duration of this particular file, how long should it play, what kind of versions, what is the copyright, is there any DRM rights available on this, and so and so on. You understand, right? Yes, yes. So everything, uh, maybe, is it a decrypt which we are using as a file system, so it's encrypted, you need to have an SSL uh, login certificate in order to have an access to this uh, MP3 file. All these things uniquely need you to write a unique loader for an MP3, right? So this MP3 player is acting like a loader inside. It has a loader program, a system program, which very well understands the characteristics of what it takes to be an MP3, and then tries to write some kind of a scheduler program inside by which it tries to, you know, actually pass it to the unique different components of your IO, right, in your application. Finally, it has to hard. Uh, it, it has to drive the different piece of the hardware on the codec, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 And there are some some tools. If I'm not wrong, uh, some tools are available to read these headers. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. That is what your OBJ bins are there, right? Yeah. So you see this binary utilities, right? Bin utils. Yeah. They are meant for that. You know. So two commands. One read elf. Okay. Now. Read the elf, you can use something like as an option called as an H, and it can read the exe file. H stands for as in header information. Okay. As you can see here. Okay. Yeah. Which talks about magic number. It's like a unique signature for an architecture it runs to. So if I had a different architecture where I was building this program, let me show you this. I'll be building this with uh, currently in another architecture. So yeah, an ARM EABI or ARM, yeah, no one. EABI. GCC, and I'll say demo dot C minus O demo dot arm. Yeah, the path is missing. Arm. Norm, ABI. I think there is a that problem. Echo dollar pet. Yeah. I have an LS slash opt. Just give me a sec. 
and um, you know you have see code source we yeah so what i can do is vim yeah i gotta come out from one of the terminal here yeah and now it will show me arm yeah not gbi you know, I was working as a root, so it doesn't have the, 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 all the paths available for okay. yeah. Linux. So ARM known Linux, yeah, this is what I was looking for, GCC. Okay, so I need a file as well. I just create, the, I can maybe copy the same file from there. A small hello dot c yeah okay. okay so there i guess okay just to show you the header magic difference it helps you in arm Set and why? Why are you not allowing me yet? Okay, I have to delete that. You know, when you're very desperate to show your results. There are Murphy laws coming up there. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I just say hello dot C and say hello dot R. or non Linux and then I'll say VDLF dash H and hello dot R. Yeah. As you can see, this magic number and another magic number has to differ on different boxes which will be running. So there is my another, yeah. This for ARM and I think we were at some other terminal, right? Yeah. There's one more. Here, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was running here. Yeah. It did as, uh, yeah. So let's try, you know, you to, Compare this. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so you can see clear differences there, right? One is for Intel, one is for, yeah, it's ARM header type is, uh, I think we need to drop down the header. You can see it's seven, F seven F four five four six four zero one zero one zero one zero one zero one zero one. Now this is the unique header magic number which explains that both of them are an elf header. If the magic number changes, it means it is meant for some other architecture. Oh, okay. Okay. So ELF can be supported by MIPS, L thirty two, L sixty four. It can be supported by other architectures like RACE. So the moment they come. They refer to the same. Okay. So as long as the ELF is a standard header, I know that, okay, first job is, are you an elf or not? Okay, okay. Got the magic number. Second thing is, what is your class type? Okay, you are a 32-bit machine. Third is then, what is your data type? So I am a two's complement machine. I understand what is a little Indian or a big Indian. I explain that. So yeah. MSB to LSB, LSB to MSB. Yeah. 
and then I understand version, then I understand what system it can be compatible to. It's a Unix style system, V compatible. It means the tool chain was built for Linux based boxes. Mm -hmm. It's an API type is executable file. Machine is running on ARM. Here you're running on Intel 80386 core. Yeah. Entry point address is different here. Starting address here is different. Okay. The number of bytes, starting section up there, and that's how the changes from it. So, you know, by ELF, header file, we know a little bit of information about them. But to know the complete details, we can use something like an A option, all the options. It's going to be pretty long. So what I do is I pipe this output with a command less so that we can paginate this. So what I said, one is the header, and the second is the section header or the body. Now, what are these sections? You can understand some of them for sure. Okay. Yeah. How many program headers do we have? We have 40. And total section headers are how much? 30. It means I spoke about the programmer's view of memory, right? Yes. You saw that dot text, dot data and all. Now here you can see hell of such sections, which I haven't spoken about. Okay, okay. For example, this talks about the sections which you have. The null descriptor segment, first segment itself is referred as null descriptor. All the null goes and refers to the same segment and dereferencing null causes you a crash, right? Then you have interpreter code. Then you have ABI tag, hash as another code section, dynamic symbols, dynamic strings, the new versions being registered, relocatable dynamic memory, relocatable procedure linker table, initializer, okay. procedure linker table. This is what you already know, dot text yeah. This is a finalizer, a constructor, destructor, read-only data, literal. Now what they do is these sections, even your data segment, if you remember, yeah. dot data, yes. dot BSS. BSS, yeah. Yeah, so some of them which programmers need is there, but this is a systems view. A lot of information which you aren't aware about is placed here. For example, if you want to talk about PLT, REL, relocatable PLT, mm -hmm. GOT, do we have a GOT here? Yeah, got. Yeah. So these are some sections which are useful for, you know, resolving the relocation of code and data. So GOT stands for Global Offset Table. Mm -hmm. It helps you to access the shared library data, shared code data. Okay. PLT stands for Procedural Link Table. It means there's a lookup table. Whenever you call a function called as printf or scan for any standard library function, then they refer to what? This finalizer, this PLT. Okay. Then you have something like, of course, other sections like initializer. It means this is a function which can be called before a main has to be. So suppose you wanted to have some kind of serialization work to be done. Mm -hmm. Say so you want to initialize certain serial ports or ethernet ports or something else before a main starts or application start. You can use something like a initializer. Okay. You want to do the cleanup activity, manual synchronization, finalizer, destructor. Similarly, an array of functions can be called and an array of functions can be removed. Getting it? Yeah, okay. So how we take the advantage of knowing all this through read ELF? is this example. So what we do is by knowing the you know base header, let's switch to another directory, which we call it as C GNU calls. Okay. I do not have the function yet synced over here. The program should have been synced. So what I do is I'll say my init.c file. And I will use, of course, edge. Uh, I have a main. Observe uh, that you know there are 
I'm not calling any function here inside, okay? Printf, I'm just writing in main. And then I have two functions here. I'll say void init com. And then I will use a attribute for as constructor. Now this is extension from GNU which we are trying to make use here. Underscore attribute, underscore attribute, construct. Com, com stands for comport or? Uh, comport, I mean, just giving a name of the function, just to show you that, you know, this is the function I would like to be called when you're, okay. okay. I think, yeah. So constructor, this should be destructor. Mm -hmm. What's very surprising is why the data is not visible to you when I placed it here. Assignments, uh, build with code. Yeah, pretty bad. What could it do? Do I need to log out and log in again just to get it refreshed? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. It was all planned there. Tool chain notes, how it can. Uh, that's very shocking to me. Uh, build with code. This is built, yeah, gonna mean. Here I have the file. What the crap? Okay, see no calls. Here I have the file, see this is what it is. You can see, right? Same thing here, which we are trying to, you know, write that we have a constructor and we have a destructor attribute, only this, yeah, syntax. And then, you know, like, you can, that's why I, I think I'm on a different directory because We'll be retyping again, that's what is the worry. Yeah, this syntax, which I wanted to remove from here. So I declare these and I can write these functions anywhere you want, you know, like as an extern in another file also. So I'll say void init com. And here I can do whatever, you know, initialization of the com. So I can, again, just to show you. Um, one, please wait. Some kind of a mimic here. Okay. Yeah. Similarly. Disable the com. Right. Get into see the new calls and I'll say GCC my any dot C minus of my init and then I'll say my init. What's happening? If you notice, I haven't made a call of these two functions inside me. Yes but still they are called before main and after main, as expected. Yeah. Very powerful thing. You see, if you know the systems concept, then you have manual extension and control which you can apply on your programs. Now you see, I'll say while one, you know, in embedded, we have a habit of while one, don't come out, keep running. Yeah. Fair enough, my con will never be disabled. It's up and running. 
So it will stuck in main. I mean, that's what we want, right? Embedded programs yeah. keeps running while one. Yeah, true. Yes. Correct? Yeah. And if I come out of the program naturally, yes. Yeah. So there can be some, you know, manual way of uh, clearing the application. Uh, you'll be, I mean, I, I don't know if it is a brag or something. I have seen people in Cisco and they're like C programmers for 20 years. And yeah. yeah and, you know, when you're on a project, it's a different scene altogether. Yeah. True, true. Yeah. So, 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 you know, giving you a system view, now you can see why do I need to know about the, the init? Or why do I need to know about the finalizer? You understand, right? Correct. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, I mean, who will have the enough time in this busy world in such a high pressure where we, you know, get down to the code base, we understand the extension of the libraries and the compiler mm -hmm. and, you know, try to investigate the code and understand these sections. If I am sure that majority of the people, when they run a read ELF with yeah. this A, he will just focus on the tech segments. He understands rest. He don't care. He don't care. Yeah. True. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, you know, as a, as a hardware engineer, you might come across a lot of things which, you know, direct C programs cannot provide. So you will find that it is not so capable, you know, so something, something that is there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you, you know, take, control of that, you will start feeling that, hey, I had a serialization technique like this. I could have done some functions called before the, because in assembly and in hardware, we have these abilities, right? We can we can have a lot of such functionality being called. There is no such rule that main has to be. There is no concept of main. Correct. Yes. Right. We just have an ORG and we keep calling functions whichever we want. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So similarly, there's another variation here, which is a multi init. Okay. Okay. For some reason, it says me the preview is not available. Okay, let me try. Okay. So maybe you know here what happens is you have a unique numbering technique which we need to you know uh, use in, which is like you know constructor followed by a name. As you can see, the source code here as a preview. And all right, I'll just open it up in a text editor. Yeah. yeah, so you can see here what's happening. Yeah, can you see the the screen? No, 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 I think I disabled it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I see that now. Yeah, yeah. So now what we do is, you can see here is begin zero, end zero, begin one, end one, begin two, end three. So, and then what we do is only the change we are making here is constructor in bracket 101, 102, 103. Remember, initializer and finalizer or constructor and destructor, mm -hmm. both should have the same. So that order of call and, you know, clearing will be the same. So you can see the main is completely independent of these functions. I'm not calling them at all. Okay. Yeah. They will ensure that, you know, before the application is rigged, I have done my serial port initialization. I have done my multimedia initialization. I have done my, you know, certificate. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, remove them and run together. So if I could copy this and paste in my virtual box, it would be good. I hope the buffer is available to be copied. Yeah. So here I might, uh, you know, say multi dot C C C. Good. It allows me here. And then I can say GCC multi. And I can run here. Here it's the, as you can see. Begin zero, begin one, begin two, then mean, then end two, end one, end zero, right? Yes. So what is this section calling about? This section talks about that that uh, multi-header which we spoke about, you know? Mm 
So when I was saying read ELF, H, or I'll say, say dash A, read ELF dash A demo dot X, okay, there is, uh, there's no directory called okay here. So I'll say read ELF dash A, say init or error dot out, okay. Yeah, I'll expand this. All right, yeah. So let's it. So I'm talking about this kind of sections now. Init array, finalize array. Okay. This maintains that, you know, numbers. Now, you might be thinking why you are starting from 101. Okay, the compiler uses this techniques from zero to 100. Oh, okay. okay. For its own initialization, like when you run the program. So that's why in extension, you are only available. So 101 is the best priority you can have. Okay. It means that's the function you want to call before me. First function to be called before me. The second function is 102. Third function is 103. And the cleaning will happen in the reverse order. First 103 will be called, then two, and then one. Okay? okay. Yeah, yeah. So that gives you a little bit of view about what? The systems view also. And what is the advantage of having a system view with us? Yes. That it allows you to give an additional control to change the flow of the normal execution of the program, govern the environment, and try to extend your code in a more robust and uh, programming manner. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think for today, what we will do as a part of this build section, we will keep it uh, uh, the session to here. While we join tomorrow, we will extend the session in terms of automating the build, trying to understand some more concept around that. You know, how do you make utilities? So how can you create some static, you know, libraries? How do you create some dynamic sure. libraries? How do you maintain them? How do you automate them? How do you write make files on them? And you know, we will uh, carry on uh, with the, those kind of experiments. Sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and then and then move forward. Okay, thank you. All right. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Anish. And uh, yeah. if, if you can quickly give me like just to go through some material tomorrow before the call, just just for me to. Yeah. So what you should do is now all these things I have documented when you. Okay. So can you share your screen by the way? Yeah. Um, so okay. Yeah, no worries. You just log in through some logs. No worries. Yeah, build with C code. Yeah, I think that's the tab you should go for. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I let's get into the. Can we come out of this a little bit? C for embedded developer, just not, yeah, the first one, yeah, yeah, double click there. And uh, um, assignments, pre reading, no, no, not pre reading, sorry. I think it should be a part of the build with code itself. Let's get into that. Okay. Just get into build directory. Yeah, yeah looks you like can open the last one two chain notes dot txt. Yeah, right click open that in your notepad or something. Yeah, see, so I've given these commands. Um, and can you scroll down a little bit? I have put the notes running conversation file formats, C build cycle. These are some steps which you can try on your own. You see, you can okay. copy this program, then phases of the program, whatever I have covered, no? all are noted over here. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll try this. So what you could do is, yeah, you can try all this. Today we discussed a lot of them. Static build, you remember? Process of static dynamic build. So this is program section. Now this is updated, right? Whatever. Yeah, it's updated, I think. Oh, yeah. okay. So you can see whatever the notes I have explained to you on that. This is a quick notes on that. Remember we spoke about programmers view. Yes. So yeah. you can see dot data, dot text, text and relocatable data, then data BSS stack and all. 
After this, we spoke about, can you scroll down, EXE personality. So you can see that ELF format. So header is there, sections are there. Yes. Probably if you open a notepad, right, it becomes easier yeah. because we still love the notepad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. All right then. Hmm? Yeah. Thanks. Uh... Sure, sure. All right then. Good night. Bye-bye. Take care.